The bilby is a desert-dwelling marsupial, native to Central and Western Australia, recognised for their very long ears. The species is well regarded in Australian culture. But when I say species, I actually mean it as a plural, because there isn't one, but two members of the bilby family. The greater bilby is still around today, but the relatively unknown species called the lesser bilby went extinct halfway through the 20th century. There isn't much research on the lesser bilby because the animal remained relatively obscure to the scientific world, even before its extinction. While there are some key differences between it and its larger sibling, think of this video as being mainly focused on the greater bilby, with references to the lesser here and there. Ultimately though, there are some concerning parallels that can be drawn between the two in terms of what drove the lesser bilby to extinction. But before we get into that, let's start with their classification. The greater bilby was first scientifically ranked in 1837 by a Mr. J. Reed. He placed the species in Peramales, a genus that was comprised of all known bandicoot species at the time. A number of these species have been moved to different genera in the years since, and Reed himself had the foresight to predict this happening to the greater bilby. He noted in his species description that because the greater bilby was so visibly different to the other members of Peramales, a separate genus may be required should more species be discovered. He proposed the name Macrotus, meaning big eared, while the greater bilby itself received the specific name Lagotus due to its resemblance to lagomorphs or rabbits. The lesser bilby would not be taxonomically recognised for a further 50 years until a specimen was forwarded to the British Museum. Zoologist Oldfield Thomas recognised its similarity to the greater bilby, but found distinctions between the two that constituted a new species. He gave the species a specific name Locura, translating to white-tailed and it became formally recognised in 1887. Throughout the late 19th and early 20th century, the classification of these species saw regular shifts and was generally just a bit of a confusing mess. It wasn't until Australian zoologist Alice Troughton reclassified the two species in 1932 under Reed's proposed genus Macrotus that their ranking began to stabilise. Other researchers have proposed different placements in the years since, but as of this video's release, Macrotus still stands as the officially recognised genus of the greater and lesser bilby. So, taxonomy aside, let's get to these species' relatives. We'll start with the bilby's closest relations and then progress to the more distant ones. To do that, we have to move all the way out to their order, Peramelomorphia, which contains all the extinct and still living bandicoot species. So even if bilbies are now recognised under their own genus, they still have a pretty close connection with bandicoots. Moving further out to their order, Polyprotodontia, we can find some distant relatives in Tasmanian devils, dunnarts, quolls, numbats, and most interestingly thylacines, an extinct carnivore more commonly known as the Tasmanian tiger. And if I go much further, we'll be into marsupials, which constitute about half of all Australian mammals, so I reckon I'll call it there. Keep in mind though that bilbies are very distinct species from even their closest relatives, as a fossilised bilby jaw was discovered in 2014 that dates back to 15 million years ago. It had shorter teeth compared to the modern day species, which suggests that its diet likely consisted of forest fruit instead of the worms and insects they eat today. Nonetheless, it's still the same animal, and it's actually thought that the bilby diverged from bandicoots around 20 million years ago, making the species about as old as giraffes and hyenas. The last aspect of the bilby's classification I'd like to cover is its name. While it might seem a bit harsh to refer to one of these species as lesser than the other, these prefixes just denote their size, with the greater being the better, sorry, the larger of the two. The term bilby derives from bilba, a loan word from the Uluwari Aboriginal language of northern New South Wales, meaning long-nosed rat. For those not in the know, a loan word is when a word from one language is permanently adopted into another, like how cafe is originally French, but used around the world. This is pretty common practice for Australian animals just broadly, with kookaburras, wombats, barramundi, kangaroos, and many others tracing their names to indigenous languages. This hasn't always been the case for many of these animals though, and bilbies are no exception. Most of the centuries old academic papers I was mentioning before refer to these animals as the rabbit-eared bandicoot and the lesser or white-tailed rabbit-eared bandicoot, a significantly more sterile name. By the time Troughton was writing on the species in 1932, he was using this term and bilby almost interchangeably, 
and in the years since, Bilby has become the more widely accepted name. But even today, regional variation still exists in the species name. It's known as the Dalgite in parts of Western Australia and Jekko by the peoples of the Lower Darling and Murray Rivers. Finally, the nickname Pinky is sometimes used in South Australia. Bilbies have a long muzzle, characteristic of bandicoots, which is used alongside their lengthy tongue to lick up food from the ground. This muzzle also gives the bilby an excellent sense of smell, which helps counteract the animal's weak eyesight. Bilbies are best recognised for their large ears, which provide them with incredibly sharp hearing and help release heat. The bilby also keeps cool thanks to being a nocturnal species, which lets them avoid the scorching hot Australian temperatures not uncommon in the parts of the country where they are found like we're talking over 40 degrees Celsius or 120 Fahrenheit. The fact that all the bilby's senses barring their vision are quite strong leads the species to keep their nose down to the ground when running, which contributes to a fairly unusual gait. Compared to bandicoots, bilbies have a longer tail and softer, silky fur. Greater bilbies feature a blue-grey coat with patches of tan, while their tails are black and white. Comparatively, the lesser bilby's colour range from pale yellowish-brown to grey-brown with white fur on its belly, limbs and tail. The differences between the greater and lesser bilbies aren't especially numerous, mostly relating to size and proportions. The head body length of greater bilbies is about 29 to 55 centimetres, or 11 to 22 inches in length, while lesser bilbies were at most half that size, ranging between only 20 to 27 centimetres, or 8 to 11 inches. Lesser bilbies had proportionally smaller ears and longer tails in relation to their size, but the biggest difference between the species can be seen in their weight. The lesser bilby weighed 300 to 435 grams, or 10 to 15 ounces, while the greater bilby is over twice as heavy, at 1 to 2.4 kilograms, or 2.2 to 5.3 pounds. This puts male greater bilbies at about the same size as a rabbit, although males in good condition have been known to grow up to 3.7 kilograms or 8.2 pounds while in captivity. By comparison, females are significantly smaller, weighing in at around 800 grams to 1.1 kilograms or 1.8 to 2.4 pounds. But beyond these measurements, we've got pretty limited information when it comes to lesser bilby, as the species was only really known to the scientific world for around half a century before they went extinct sometime in the 1950s or 60s. This is a case where there simply isn't enough information out there about this species for me to make a separate video on it, so this is really my only chance to talk about it. There's some topics where I can give you plenty of information about the greater bilby, while we are next to nothing but the lesser and can only infer that it was somewhat similar, like for example their life expectancy. In captivity, greater bilbies typically live for at least six years, with some even reaching a decade. However, the lifespan in their natural environment is likely much shorter as wild caught bilbies tend to be less than a year old. Female greater bilbies become reproductively active at six months and can breed all year round if conditions are favourable. Like most marsupials, female bilbies have a pouch to carry their young in, but this animal is distinct from species like kangaroos and wallabies in that their pouch faces backwards. This is actually true of many marsupials, and in this case it's to prevent it getting filled with dirt while she's digging which bilbies are well suited for, with strong forelimbs and well-developed claws. Bilbies make good use of this skill, as unlike bandicoots, they are excellent burrowers and are capable of building extensive tunnel systems. An adult bilby typically makes up to a dozen burrows in its home range and moves between them for shelter, both from predators and the heat of the day. These burrows typically spiral down like a corkscrew, which makes it more difficult for predators to reach them. Bilbies are known to dig up to 2 to 3 metres or 7 to 10 feet deep when making their burrows, and cover the entrance with loose sand while they sleep during the day. This task takes up a lot of the animal's energy, but this is mitigated somewhat by the existence of old burrows. Bilbies will regularly repair and use these holes also, meaning that some burrows have been used for dozens of generations, dating back hundreds of years. Greater bilbies are generally solitary animals, but they do occasionally travel in pairs. Interestingly, these pairs usually consist of two females. Like in my video on the ring-tailed lemur, greater bilbies have a female-led social hierarchy, 
where lower ranked males are often turned down during the mating season. But unlike the ring-tailed lemur, communication between greater bilbies is limited, largely due to their reclusive nature. Their poor eyesight certainly doesn't help either, but because this animal rarely interacts with more than a few of its own species, this doesn't pose a major limitation. They occasionally vocalise to each other, but most communication that does occur is through olfactory means, typically scent marking. This primarily functions as a means of communication with members of the same sex, since female bilbies rarely pay much attention to male scents, and those males are never aggressive towards their female counterparts. After mating, males have pretty much no role in raising the young, which is mainly why travelling pairs tend to consist of just females. Greater bilbies have a very small gestation period of about 12 to 14 days, one of the shortest among mammals. The young are only 6 millimetres or a quarter of an inch long when they are born, and must crawl to the mother's pouch and latch onto one of her eight teats. They leave the pouch after 70 to 75 days, and remain in the burrow for a further 2 to 3 weeks before becoming independent. Litters usually consist of 1 to 3 joeys, and females can have up to 4 litters per year in favourable conditions. Now onto their diet. Greater bilbies are a highly mobile species when it comes to foraging, with females travelling up to 1.5 kilometres, or just under a mile between their burrows, and males travelling up to 5 kilometres, or 3 miles. Greater bilbies are classed as omnivores and don't actually need to drink water, as they get all the moisture they need from their food. This includes insects and their larvae, seeds, spiders, termites, bulbs, fruit, fungi, and very small animals. Most food is found by simply digging or scratching at the soil, and using their long snouts and tongues I mentioned before. However, this feeding style means that bilbies eat a lot of sand, which can make up 20-90% to of their faecal waste. Lesser bilbies were much the same way, feeding on ants, termites, roots and seeds, but also hunting introduced rodents. Much of the plant diet of bilbies is facilitated by fires that occasionally run through Australian regions, and aid in the regrowth of plants that the species prefers. Now this might go against your assumptions about fires, but Australia is really a country that's designed to burn, and this is reflected by the native plants found across the nation. The issue is that due to the negative effects of human-led climate change, these fires are becoming increasingly more widespread and hotter, resulting in greater destruction of native plant and animal populations. Greater bilbies are generally recognised as quiet and timid animals, which is fairly typical for a nocturnal species. Records of the lesser bilby are comparatively far fewer, but the accounts we do have contrastingly describe the species as aggressive and tenacious. Australian mammologist Hedley Finlayson wrote on the animal in the 1930s, so bear with me on some of the dense language here. He said that the species was fierce and intractable, and repulsed the most tactful attempts to handle them by repeated savage snapping bites and harsh hissing sounds. While their distribution may differ somewhat, both species of bilby prefer arid habitats due to the presence of spinifex grass and acadia shrubs. This puts them in a pretty remote part of the country, where there aren't too many predators around. Still, both species are naturally predated on by dingoes and wedge-tailed eagles, the largest bird of prey in the continent. Introduced predators include cats and red foxes, while rabbits compete for the same food and habitat. Together, these three species have had a huge impact on the bilby that I'll get to later on. Globally, bilbies don't have a huge cultural impact in the way that many Australian animals do, but within the country they have an important role to play. Starting with a lesser bilby, it's used as the symbol of the Australian Wildlife Conservancy, or AWC, one of the largest non-profits in the country responsible for protecting endangered species across more than 12.9 million hectares, or 31.8 million acres of land. They use the lesser bilby as their symbol because it's, and I quote, a stark reminder of the responsibility we share to ensure the great variety of wildlife that survives is given the best chance to flourish. Over a third of the world's extinctions from the last 400 years have come from Australia, and the country has already lost 31 mammal species. Lesser bilbies are just one of these. When we look at the reasons why in the next section, I think it'll be clear that they're an excellent candidate to represent the AWC. Now, onto the greater bilby, and we actually have a media appearance. The 2018 DreamWorks short film simply titled Bilby features a member of the species as its lead character. The eight minute production was well liked, 
receiving the Jury's Choice Award at SIGGRAPH, a computer graphics conference held that year in Vancouver, and an Audience Award at the Palm Springs International Festival of Short Films. The film was originally pitched to be feature length under the title Larrikins, and was set to be scored by Tim Minchin. It featured a star-studded cast, but the production was ultimately cancelled and repurposed into the finished product we have today. You can watch the entire thing for free on Vimeo, but I don't think the uploader actually has the rights to it, and I mean, besides, you didn't hear this from me. Most modern recognition of the Bilby comes from its popularization as an alternative to the Easter Bunny. Much like cats and foxes, rabbits are an invasive species in Australia and do a lot of damage to the natural environment, so they are especially well liked by the broader public. Because they visually share a lot in common with rabbits and are an endemic species, bilbies have been marketed and sold in much the same way in recent years. The whole rabbit laying egg thing unfortunately isn't mitigated by swapping out lagomorphs for marsupials, but an Easter emu or crocodile maybe aren't quite as cute. Chocolate bilbies in the same vein as chocolate bunnies are manufactured by a number of Australian brands, but for most of them this decision is not purely profit driven as the intent of this movement is also to raise awareness and capital to fund conservation efforts. The Adelaide-based brand Hayes Chocolates made 950,000 chocolate bilbies between 1993 and Easter 2020, with a portion of proceeds donated to the foundation of Rabbit Free Australia, which has environmental work to protect the indigenous biodiversity in the country. A National Bilby Day is held in Australia on the second Sunday of September every year to raise funds for conservation projects like these. And on the topic of conservation, let's get into it in the next section. Starting with the lesser bilby, very little is known about its former range and distribution, as the species was collected only six times in modern history, with the first of these coming from an unknown region. What we do know is that it was endemic to the Gibson and Great Sandy Deserts of arid central Australia. In 1931, Finlayson encountered many of them near Coonsherry Station, collecting 12 live specimens. Although he stated that the animal was abundant in the area, these were the last lesser bilbies to be collected alive. The last specimen ever found was a skull picked up below a wedge-tailed eagle's nest in 1967 at Steel Gap in the Simpson Desert, Northern Territory. The bones were estimated as being under 15 years old, which is corroborated by Aboriginal oral stories that suggests the species likely survived until the early 1960s. The decline and ultimate extinction of the lesser bilby is attributed to a number of factors. Introduced rabbits produced competition for food, and the fact that the species was invasive led to degradation of the bilby's natural habitat. Even worse, cats and foxes both laid havoc to the bilby population, as the species lacked the evolutionary adaptability to avoid being hunted en masse. This is true of so many Australian species, and this kind of thing is not uncommon in regions where these animals have been introduced, often during colonisation. Frustratingly, foxes and rabbits were deliberately introduced to Australia in the mid-19th century for the explicit purpose of recreational hunting. So they were brought here for already unethical reasons, only to go on to inadvertently destroy the native ecosystem. This meant that the lesser bilby quickly faded out of existence, with limited conservation action only hastening its decline. Alright, well, I mean, that sucks, but what about the greater bilby? The bad news is that while the greater bilby is still around, all of these factors continue to plague its population in much the same way. Taking a look at the IUCN Red List, we can see that the greater bilby is listed as a vulnerable species, which is, I mean, unsurprising when we consider that it's estimated that the animal has been pushed back to around 10% of its former range, which once covered 70% of Australia's total landmass. The fact that greater bilbies can live in a variety of habitats, eat a range of foods, survive without standing water and breed rapidly means that they simply should be far more common than they are. The species was once well known around Adelaide, especially in the city parklands. It was also recorded as living as far out as Perth, but today, the greater bilby is being pushed further and further into the northwest corner of the country. However, intense conservation action is being undertaken, which has helped slow a quick decline in population that we saw with a lesser bilby. Reintroduction efforts have been successful in South Australia, Queensland and Western Australia thanks to efforts in captive breeding, monitoring populations and re-establishing bilbies where they once lived. There are so many organisations doing great work in this field, but I'd like to point you in the direction of the Save the Bilby Fund, 
a leading nonprofit in bilby conservation. I'll link their website in the description below, which contains plenty of information on the importance of this species. If you're able, consider sending them a donation to help save the bilby. Hi, we're the Wiggles. And this is Banjo the Bilby. Bilbies have lived in Australia for millions of years, but are now almost extinct. You can help save the bilby and other endangered Australian animals by celebrating National Bilby Day on the second Sunday in September. Join us in showing the world that we care about saving our Australian animals by going to savethebilbyfund.org to see how you can help. Thank you so much for watching. This has been my longest script yet, so I hope you enjoyed it. As always, there's plenty more information about these guys out there, and there's bound to be super interesting stuff that I've missed. I'll be back at uni by the time this video is up, but I'm going to try to hold myself to the same three week schedule during the semester if I can. That being said, in my next video, we'll be taking a look at the red deer. One of the largest species of deer found in parts of Asia, North Africa, Europe, and as an introduced species in New Zealand, Australia, and South America. If you're interested in hearing about that or future stuff, you can subscribe and hopefully I'll see you again soon.